Sometimes your methods might return simple values. So for example, the save customer method in the customer class returns a 1 if the customer information was saved and a negative 1 if it wasn't. So these two values cover the cases. This method might also return true if the customer information was saved and false otherwise. Either way, a simple value, 1 or true if it worked, negative 1 or false if it didn't. But there will be times when you want to return more complex values. So for example, we might want the getCustomerInfo method to return multiple pieces of customer information. And a nice way to do that would be to return that information in an array. Typically, you'll know how many parameters a method takes. For example, you might pass the customer ID to a method and return the information on that customer. But there will be times when you don't know ahead of time how many parameters you need to pass to a method. And in those cases, you can use a parameter array. And that basically gives you the ability to call a method with a variable number of parameters. Let's go see a demo of returning information in an array and also using parameter arrays. I'm in the sample application. Let's go see an example of retrieving information from a method in an array. We're going to create a new instance of the customer class. This is some customer. And we want to retrieve information for that customer. So we're going to call the getCustomerInfo method and pass to it the customer ID and then also pass to it an array that will be used to store information on that customer. So to do this, we'll first create an array called CustomerInfo. It's an array of strings. There are, will be six of them, and this string is currently empty. And we're going to pass that by reference to the getCustomerInfo method and let that method fill out the customer info. So let's step into this. GetCustomerInfo takes the customer ID, which is big as a parameter, and by reference, the empty array of strings. We'll then read an XML file and fill out the array. So we'll create an instance of the XML reader class and tell it to read the file c colon backslash big dot XML. And then have it go to the first customer element and inside that it'll find a customer ID element. The contents of that are stored to the first element in the array. The customer name element is stored to the second element in the array, and the XML reader class will continue reading the XML and will store the contents of city, region, postal code, and country to the various elements of the array. And at this point, this array, which came in as empty strings, now contains the information for this customer. Let's step out of this method and return to the calling code. And again, because the array was passed by reference, that information is available to us in the calling code, and we can display it. And here's the customer. So we passed into this method the customer ID and an empty array. We got back from this method the array filled out with the information we're looking for. That's an example of retrieving information using an array. Let's now look at an example of passing a parameter array to a method. And why would we do that? Well, we would do that because we're going to pass a varying number of parameters. So in this example, we're going to call the record orders method of the customer class to record order information on two different customers. So we'll create a new instance of the customer class. And then we're going to record information for Big, who placed four orders. Following that, we'll record information for Small, who placed two orders. To store that order information, we'll create an array. The order info array is an array of integers. And in the first example, it contains four integers. And those are the four order IDs for the orders placed by big. Then we'll call the record orders method and pass the customer ID and that array. 
Let's step into this. Record orders takes the customer ID as a string and an array of integers, and to identify that this is a parameter array, we use the param array keyword. So orders, again, contains those four order IDs. And then we're going to write this information to an XML file. We'll create an instance of the XML writer settings class and identify that we want the XML to be indented and that we want to use a carriage return line feed when it's time to create a new line. Then we'll create an instance of the XML writer class and pass to it the name of the XML file we want to create, which is c colon backslash big underscore orders dot XML. Then we'll start writing the XML. First, we'll use the write start document method to write the XML declaration at the top of the file. Then we'll write an orders tag. And within that orders tag, we'll write individual order tags for each order. So we'll have a for loop here that starts at zero and goes to the upper bound of orders, which is four. Then we'll write an order tag. Next, we'll write a customer ID tag with the customer ID, and then an order tag that contains the first order ID. And we'll do that for each order. Let's run to cursor outside of that loop. We've now written each of the individual orders. We'll use write end element to close off this orders tag finish writing the XML document, and close the instance of the writer class. And now when we return to the calling code, we should see in C colon backslash that we've created the file big underscore orders. Let's take a look at that in Notepad. And here's the file. We have an orders tag, and within there, we've written each of the four orders. Now let's do this again with a different customer. Small has placed two orders. We'll create a new instance of the order info array containing the two orders placed by customer small. Then we'll run the method, and now we've created small underscore orders dot XML, which contains just the two orders. Methods take parameters, and typically you'll pass all of the parameters to the method. The method's expecting a certain amount of information, and you'll supply that. However, there may be times when you don't necessarily know all of the information that a method can take. And in those occasions, you can take advantage of optional parameters. To identify a parameter as optional, you use the optional keyword. You're therefore telling the method that that parameter may or may not be passed. Now you need to put optional parameters at the end of the parameters list, and then of course you'll need to write code in the method to account for the fact that this parameter may or may not be passed. When you create a method and identify the parameters that it's taking, you list them in a particular order. That then becomes the order that the method's expecting you to pass the arguments. You do have the luxury, however, of passing arguments in any order you want, and you do that by naming them. And here's an example of that. The constructor of the customer class is expecting customer ID followed by customer name followed by city, region, postal code, and country. That's the way the code is written. That's the way the method expects things by default. But in this example, we're passing the arguments in a different order. And we're telling the constructor which argument is which. So for example, customer name colon equals Big Industries tells the method that the first parameter we're passing is the customer name parameter. Country colon equals USA identifies that the second parameter is the country parameter. We do that for all of the parameters, and now we've passed the appropriate information to the constructor, but we pass them in an order of our choosing. Let's go see optional and named parameters in a demo. Let's take a look at using optional parameters. 
we're going to record sales information for customers. And the record sales method takes three parameters typically. The first is customer ID, the second is the dollar amount of the sale, and the third are the units involved in the sale. So first, we'll create a new instance of the customer class, and then we'll record the sales for customer big, passing in dollar amount and units. Let's step into this, and in this example, we know what the sales are, and we know what the units are. So we're then going to write this information to an XML file, big underscore sales. Let's do that, step out of here, return back to the calling code. And what's written is the XML file, big underscore sales dot XML. Let's take a look at that. And here's the sales information for big, the dollar amount of sales, and the units sold. Well, what happens if we don't always know the units? We have in this application the ability to record sales for a customer when we only know the dollar amount. So what we want to be able to do is call record sales and pass the customer ID and just the sales figure. We have a couple ways we can do this. One is we can create two definitions for the record sales method. One that takes three parameters, one that takes two parameters. Then in the first example, we'd call the overloaded method of record sales that takes three parameters. In the second version, we'd call the overloaded record sales that takes only two parameters. Well, the problem with that is after you pass in the parameters, the code in both of those methods does the exact same thing. Well, you could certainly have two versions of record sales that takes a different number of parameters and then calls a third method to do the actual writing of the XML. But in this case, maybe the best option is to identify that third parameter as being optional. So here, we're going to call the record sales method and pass in just two parameters, the customer ID and a dollar amount. Let's step into that. The reason we can do that is because this third parameter, units, is declared optional. Optional parameters need to come at the end of the list, and you also need to supply a default value. So by default, if we don't pass that parameter in, it'll be set to negative one. So the customer ID is small, the sales is 100,000, and the units is negative one. Now we'll create the XML file. Let's run to cursor here. And if units is negative one, then we write the value unknown into the units tag. Otherwise, we write the value we passed in. And now what we've done is we've written an XML file, small underscore sales dot XML, which has the customer ID and the sales number we passed in, and unknown is the units. So the benefit of being able to use the optional parameter is we have one version of the record sales method, and we can pass in all three or only two of the parameters depending on whether or not we know the third. If we don't know the third, we don't have to pass it, and the code in the method takes care of the fact that the units are unknown. Let's return to the menu and take a look at named arguments. Named arguments give us the flexibility of passing parameters in in any order we want to. Let's create a new instance of the customer class. And let's call the constructor passing in the arguments in the order they're expected. So here's the constructor for this class expecting customer ID, customer name, city, region, postal code, and country in that order. And in this first example, that's exactly what we've done. So we pass the information in the order it was expected, and the various properties of the customer are set. And that information is displayed. Here's customer big industries. 
what we can also do is pass that information in in any order we want. So in this example, we're going to control the order things get passed. We have to specify the parameters we're passing. We have the opportunity of changing the order. So to specify the parameters, we name them. That involves typing the name, followed by a colon and an equal sign. So here, we're saying this parameter we're passing in is the customer name parameter. And the customer ID, which by default is expected to be the first parameter, we're sending at the end, but we're identifying that by saying customer ID colon equals big. We do that for the other parameters. Now, the constructor is OK with that. We've passed in the customer ID, the customer name, the city. So the constructor receives the information it's expecting and understands which argument is which. We had the luxury of passing these in in the order we wanted. The result is exactly the same. So named arguments just gives you the flexibility of passing in arguments in your own order. Another place named arguments will come in handy is when you have optional parameters. Here we're calling the record sales method. We're passing in the customer ID, and we're going to pass in the sales amount and not pass in the units. And we're going to specifically identify that this argument represents sales. When we run this code, we create the XML file, same way as we did before. What we did was we specifically identified the parameter we were passing. What this will really come in handy is when you're doing office automation, for example, working with Excel or Word. Many of the methods in office applications take a large number of parameters, many of which are optional. You'll often find it to be true that you want to pass the first argument, and the other one you need to pass is somewhere in the middle of the list. The ability to pass arguments with names gives you the flexibility of just identifying only the arguments you care about, giving them a name, and then you can safely ignore all the optional ones that you aren't passing. Variables have a scope, and the default scope for a variable is that if you declare a variable in a method, it's only available as long as that method executes. When you're done with the method, the variable disappears. However, you can create a static variable which retains its value even after the method has completed. A good example of when you might need a static variable is if you want to have a counter. You want to know how many times a method is executed. You could create a static variable incremented each time the method is called. Or you might want to record total sales. So you create a static variable to represent the total sales. And then each time you run the method to record sales, you increment that variable. This concept of static also applies to properties and methods in a class. By default, the members of a class require you to create an instance of the class first. And they're called instance members. A perfect example of this is the read to following method of the XML reader class. So in this line of code here, we're reading an XML file, and we want to keep reading until we find the next instance of the customer name element. Well, you can't call read to following unless you first created an instance of the XML reader class. And in this case, that's what reader represents. The alternative is a static member. A static member can be called without first creating an instance of the class. And a great example of that is the write line method in the console class. You can just type the code console.writeline and call the writeline method. You don't have to first create an instance of the console class and then call writeline on that instance. By default, members of a class are instance members, but you can specify that you want members to be static members. Let's go see a demo of static variables and then static and instance members. We've got the sample application running. Let's take a look at static variables first. 
So in this method, we're going to ask what time is it three times? So in a loop, we're going to call this method what time is it? And then we want to record how many times we've asked. So let's step into this code and let's go into the what time is it method. We're declaring a variable counter as an integer and setting its value equal to zero. This counter inside the what time is it method will keep track of how many times we've asked. By default, this variable would be reset every time we entered the what time is it method. But we can declare it static and therefore the scope of this variable is elevated. The variable no longer exists only in the method, but we can declare this variable to static and that extends the lifetime of the variable. So the variable now exists even after the methods run. So let's step through this. Counter starts off at zero and since this is the first time we've been in the method, we increment it by one and we display the time and how many times we've asked. So it's now this time and we've asked once. Okay, we'll keep asking. So we'll ask a second time and now when we come into the what time is it method, counter retains its value, which is one. So the equal zero is the initial value, but because this variable is static, it retains the value. We increment it and we display that we've asked again for the time. Let's do this one more time. And now when we come in, counter is equal to two, it gets incremented, and finally we're done and we display that we've asked three times what time it is. So because we declared this variable as static, its lifetime is longer than just the method. In fact, the lifetime of this is the entire application. Every time we call this method, while this application's running, we can access this variable and its value is retained. Well, that's a variable. Let's look at doing essentially the same thing with fields of a class. We want to record sales for various customers and we really want to know what the total sales are for the day. So first we're going to create a new instance of the customer class. Then we're going to record sales for this customer who has done looks like a hundred million dollars in sales and five hundred thousand units total. So let's step into the record sales method and see what's happening. Record sales takes the customer ID, the dollar amount, and the units as parameters, and then declares a static field called cumulative sales, which starts out at zero. Then we're going to record these sales and write these as an XML file. And when we're done with that, we're going to increment this static variable cumulative sales by the amount of sales. So it was zero and now it's a hundred million representing these sales. Then we're going to update the total sales property of the class and set it equal to cumulative sales. So at this point, the cumulative sales are a hundred million and the total sales for the class are also a hundred million. Then we'll display the first order, 100 million. Next, we're going to record sales for small. They've done 10 million in sales and 50,000 units. Let's step into record sales, and we'll see that cumulative sales starts out at 100 million, which is the value that was at the end of the previous record sales method. We'll write the XML and run down to here. And we're going to increment cumulative sales by the amount of this sale. And cumulative sales is now $110 million. Then we'll update the total sales property as well. 
and then we'll display the second order amount, $10 million. Finally, we'll record the third sale, which is for the tiny company, and they've done a million dollars in revenue and 5,000 units. Let's step into this, and we'll see one last time that cumulative sales is the $110 million, and then one last time, We'll increment that by the million dollars. Cumulative sales is now $111 million. We'll display this third order. And now, because we've been keeping track of that, the total sales property of the customer class, $111 million. And we can display the total across these three sales. And we're able to do that because we declared the cumulative sales field to be static. It lives inside the record sales method and it retains its value across various sales being recorded. Finally, let's look at static methods. We're actually using two static methods in this one line of code. The first static method is right line, which we've been using throughout. That belongs to the console class, and it's a static method, meaning we don't have to create an instance of the console class to use this method. Well, get customer name is also static. We can directly call the get customer name method of the customer class and pass to it a customer ID and have this method return the name of the customer. Let's step into that and see how this works. To make the method static, we declare it as shared. Shared means that this method does not require an instance of the class to be called. And the method simply retrieves the XML file for this customer, finds the customer name, and then returns that to the calling code. And we can display that the customer big is big industries. So in this demo, you've seen static variables and static fields and they retain their value across multiple uses. Their lifetime is longer than the method they were declared in. And you also saw a static method, which can be called without first instantiating the class.